Well, firstly, maybe my going to the States was in itself an accident, you know. I was in a refugee camp in Botswana suffering really, for one year something. No transport to go for to Dar es Salaam. So I got a lift uh, from one plane, Scandinavian plane, taking some refugees. Ended up in Congo, Leopoldville that time, Kinshasa. Then really refugee camps, a terrible situation. The war has just ended there, and still UN people are still there. That's where I met for the first time African American, you know, to see a face for the first time. And then, uh, just to make a long story short, I went to accompany one of my colleagues from Mozambique. Uh, there was somebody who came from America, from State Department, to interview some refugees, to give some scholarships and so on. Then I just accompanied the guy, and I was sitting somewhere, and they were talking, talking. When they finished, he asked, uh, are you also from Mozambique? I said, no, I'm from Southwest Africa. So oh, we had Mr. Chibanga here, or Swapo. Why well, didn't you mention, what's your name? I said, can go. No, he didn't mention your name. What's your background? I said, well, I was a teacher, so-called teacher at home. But uh, I'm supposed to go to Ghana to go and study there. Then he asked my background, he said, but you are more qualified than the ones he was giving us, you know. I said, but there's another one who's qualified than I was. That's a guy who was at Roma, nearly became a Catholic priest, but then quit. So we're together. So we came and saw him, and then he took our names. Uh, in one week's time, we got a letter signed by Dean Rusk. And I used to always boast that my scholarship was approved by Secretary of State Dean Rusk himself. Maybe we never even saw my name, maybe somebody just said that thing, but I used to boast that my scholarship was approved by Dean Rusk. Then, from there on, in no time, this arranged that we went to the States, came to Lincoln University for orientation. All of us were going there for orientation. And thereafter, I ended up in New York because then I was also appointed a swap, swap representative and I had to be close to to United Nations. Seek also, you know. Then uh, that you have to pick up now English, mathematics, all the deficiencies we had, had to make up. So, a lot of studies. And eventually went to New York. When I came to New York, I was at uh, Manhattan College. Manhattan College is again a Jesuit college too. It's in Bronx. And Manhattan College was tough. Because it's a strictly liberal college, liberal arts college. You have to do Greek literature, Greek history, Greek philosophy, Greek art, arts, and then selective courses. So I used to talk to the father. I said, but father, I came here to prepare to go back and go and rule my country. Now, what do I do with the Greek philosophy, Greek, Greek, Greek? Then these discussions were going on, and he said, maybe you're at the wrong place. I see your point, but we cannot change our curricula because of one person. That's what we do here, to ground the liberal art people properly. That's a proper grounding. And next will be, it's now the Roman. I said, but I'm not here for those things. Why is this African studies then? So they were, my lady was, of course, in touch already with me. So I explained to him that I have a problem with my, my Latin college. Then he said, maybe Fordham is a bigger university. We have elective courses there and so on. So that's how the Fordham idea came. He talked to some people there, and from there I was transferred to Fordham University. That's what happened. So that you have selective, you know, choice, it is to choose 
not just Roman or Greek philosophy. Oh, Greek, Greek. Anyway, so that's how I came to forum in 1967, huh? 68, because I graduated in 1970 from Fordham. So Fordham was good because Fordham was big and the variety of courses. And don't, don't forget, I came in the States during the time there was this Black Power movement. It was tough. And even at our campus, there were problems. And I used to help them because they were looking up to me. I'm an African, proper African. <laughs> so I used to kind of advise them what we are doing here, our struggle and so on. I used to go to their house. They had a house, a spirit house or whatever. They bought a house on campus. And black African students were meeting the African Americans. And I was too busy struggling to catch up and also my other activities. So they invited me once or twice, and I was so disappointed. I went there, and they would be sitting in a, <laughs> in a kind of a circle, and they would be talking poetry, poetry, and then the Dacha, the Marwana. They said, what the hell is this to me? Because when you are in a struggle, our struggle is too serious, you see. So I said, what's some of these people trying to pass, you know, Dakar around? So I skip it. I said, I don't smoke. They said, but this is the spirit. I said, I'm an African. I know it's not the case. <laughs> so I, I didn't go anymore there. Because I had to do many other things. I had to go to the UN to hang around there. And I will tell you, because of my uh, activities at the UN, I used to start my classes at Fordham around 11 o'clock because I could choose the topics. And that is, there's a reason for that. Then I used to go to 11, from 11 to about 2. Then around from 3, I'm at the UN. Wasting time, nobody pays attention to you. You are a petitioner, you're not trying to stop a person, they just pass you, you know, and it's a tough. But then uh, I'll come back around 6 o'clock. When I was coming back 6 o'clock, uh, people are watching TV and they are talking. So therefore, I wouldn't study. So I'll watch TV until around 10, when they go to sleep, that's the time I would not study. So my studies will be from 10 up to 1, basically. Up to now, that's now my body clock that I have. If I were to go to bed to sleep about 9, I'll wake up by 2 and never sleep again, up to now. So that was now the routine, to go to school 11, out by about 2, to UN, hang around there, and then come back around 6, watch TV, eat, play with other people, and then study when they are sleeping, up to 1 or so. If you're a term paper, sometimes up to 2, 3. So that is a routine. Combining uh, studies and kind of UN activity was very good. Tough, but good, because when I was taking an international law, international relations, that was my topic too, uh, it was again also the Vietnam War question. And you had beautiful democracy that time. I really was impressed. Here were professors from Ivy League University, Ivy League, like Princeton and Columbia. I know still Richard Falk was from from Princeton, radical guy. We even use him eventually at the court. So these guys will be debating now. I come from this apartheid background, no freedom, no quarreling, no debates, you know, no disagreeing. So I saw now these guys really going at it, you know. One is opposed to the war, and it is argued legally and otherwise. 
The other one gets out and condemns the government for being in a in Vietnam war, Ill, Ill, immoral war, and this kind of thing. I say, oh, how can you say government is immoral, that kind of a thing. Those are all new concepts. But that was the era that America was, I think, at the best. It's a democratic country, not today. Those days, you really, as a beginner who came to learn how democracies work and so on, study the, that time, Descent, you know, the there's a war, black white war actually. People like Malcolm X, I met him, I went to Hotel Teresa because he came with our names from Cairo, Eswapo representatives. So we are about to talk how we can cooperate, work, and a month after that he was killed. Uh, then I was with the black power groups, you know. Quite tough days, you know, quite Things were not that easy. Hatred to black white was unbelievable. So I went through that. I was trying to advise them, but I was also becoming racist. You know, it was very interesting thing. And then, as I said, all campuses started to get uh, African studies, and within that African studies, my professor turned out to be Tilton Lamel. Lamel, you will check. He was. Uh, political science teacher, but I give credit to him. I was an African from African continent, as an African American, but I didn't know Africa. He taught me Africa, I keep on telling people. He taught me Africa and Pan-Africanism. I knew about maybe Namibia, South Africa, that was it, and Ghana, because of independence of Ghana, talk about in Nigeria maybe, but rest, I never knew anything about French-speaking African countries until that professor was definitely my mentor. He took us through these African courses and I learned Africa from him. Very good professor. And then I finished at Fordham University. Uh, and then I got an offer, unexpected offer. I accompanied my president. His house is just here, the founding president of Namibia, Sam Nyoma's house is just there where he stays. So I, we went to the UN. I was a petitioner, I was a representative. And we went to see Secretariat people, Mr. Jemakwe, they called him. And he says, you must give us one person to work with us here because there was an idea of termination of the mandate and direct taking over by UN to administer Namibia, theoretically, of course. So give us one person. My colleague, President, my colleague here, and I jumped, I said, no, uh, our qualification, what do you want? First degree. So I just got my first degree. And I was still hesitant, you know, why me? Just like that, no consultations. So my name was given just in public like that. That's the Nyoma, you know. And then uh, I delayed. They were asking me to come in. I said, no, I'm still busy. And eventually I reported on the 3rd of January, 1972. That's the same day they Kurt Waltham took over UN Secretary General's position. So I said we started at the same time. Took the oath together, I claim. So I uh, started to work there. Basically, there was what is now called the United Nations Council for Namibia. After a long debate, after the International Court of Justice, throughout the case, uh, maybe you know that history, and then the UN was caught up. So it was a question of what more is there? We went to the highest court of the world to get justice, but we got injustice. So what do we do now? So some talk about armed struggle. That is now around uh, 66 that they started the armed struggle question. 72, there was already a government, so to say, a United Nations Council for Namibia, which was kind of a government 
in exile. And because of the needed me, the resolution was saying it must govern Namibia with the maximum participation of Namibians. So therefore, I had to be that maximum participant. <laughs> but then we had to evolve projects. So I played a role in a program called Nationhood Program. Uh, that was a program aimed at training Namibians to prepare them for nationhood. And I gave the local kind of input. The other professors, the prof professionals you now, they wrote their papers and so on. It was mainly dealing with scholarships, to give scholarships to Namibians, to train them in different areas. But towards the end of that, we thought of preparing because South Africa said at the court that Namibians don't have education. Of course, that was their failure. They were supposed to prepare us. So you went therefore thought some African countries that there should be an institution besides scholarships to prepare Namibians for administrative, you know, positions. Hence the idea of the United Nations Institute for Namibia came up. And I never thought I would be considered to be part of that. And they set it up in Osaka. They had the first meeting of the Senate. That meeting had uh, Professor Adedeji as chairman, who is a well-known Nigerian economist. And he was also the Undersecretary for Economic Commission for Africa for over 12 years. So he was a chairman. And then Adishari was also a member of the Senate. That's how Adishari came into this Namibian thing. And they met in, in Lusaka, apparently. And I didn't think I would be the one even to be considered. I knew the stakes were high. Uh, there was somebody already identified from Tanzania, from Attorney General of Tanzania. So. I got a call from Zambian embassy, mission to the UN, say, congratulations. What for what? Now you are the director of the Institute for Namibia. I said, no, it can't be. And then apparently what happened is that Lusaka Semnyoma came from the hospital, from checkup, we were sitting there, and we had a commissioner called Sean McBride. Irish man, fighting Irish, tough guy, old man. Oh, what a difference, you know, he brought the, he shook up the United Nations system. Uh, so he had his uh, Tanzanian as a director, and then Semi Oma said, I have my own candidate. Who? Gottfried. He said, oh, Gottfried must go to school. This is an institute to train Namibians, not Namibians to train others. <laughs> So he says, well, I'm sorry. If you are supporting us to govern the country and you think we cannot even manage an institution, then keep your institution, you are wasting my time. He got up, he was about to leave, and then Adesari played and said, now look, let's get a CV of this man. Who is he? We don't know him, so let's get a CV. So he did for Montaigne was asked to write a CV. I didn't even write a CV. If the Dipo Hamadina wrote my CV, gave them, he only made two mistakes. One is my age. I was already regarded as very young that time, and he still reduced my age by one year. So that was the only mistake. But that, that CV, I used to use it myself too, for some time. So that's why I was appointed there. I was scared. But normally when I'm appointed to any post, I just study, I buy books. I locked myself up in the UN cubicle, started to read on management and so on. And I, all of a sudden, from a junior staff member, I was called in the meetings of the directors of UN system. I said, my God, I didn't know what is going on. And then came to Lusaka, a big challenge, set up the institution. In fact, having multicultural, multiracial, uh, staff 
They were saying that the person must have experience in management and to manage different, you know, cultures and so on. So we did it. Give a person a chance, they will do it. After now, I'm still in touch with some of my international staff, Indians and so on, still writing me. And one I just talked to yesterday, Mr. Dugal. So that's what happened, and that institution was supposed to train Namibians in middle level civil service positions. And I'm telling you, people are laughing at it, but today, if you walk around here, you will see that most people who are in charge of administration, management, are from there, and I'm very proud of that. If you take the chief justice of this country, Peter Shivute is from that institution. Of course, we did enter into relationship with other universities, like Warwick, Sussex, and East Anglia, and so on, so that they, they need the, you know, what do they call it? Uh, British need some other, other requirement before you go to university. So with us, that agreement, they could go directly to university. So Chief Justice, Judge President, Petrus Tamazov, Attorney General, Minister of Justice, some parasitical result like Shibute, Dr. Shibute from East Anglia, uh, of the water, now Nam water. You can name them like that and go to permanent secretaries and some other ordinary directors and so on. I go around, I feel very old because some people are very older than me. And they say, director. Even when I was a prime minister, they had to call me director. Then I knew they were my students from that side. So that's a very, very good uh, contribution we made through UN to prepare the staff. And I'm telling you, we are teacher training and also magistrate training. The system nearly collapsed here. But those magistrates that were half-baked, even the whites who were so looking down on our training had to admit that thing rescued the whole system. So that was the contribution from UN. Voluntary funds from member states, the United States used to give quite a good amount, a half a million, I think, and other countries were all donating. All the UN institutes for the voluntary donations of the member states. Very good. We did also research studies. I'll give the summary of the big study we did. And that study was a comprehensive study sanctioned by UN General Assembly. And when I came back now, uh, we based, I said the government ministry based on that study. Because we did study every aspect of governance. Departments, ministries that you may set up and so on. So it's just easier for me to set up the ministries here. Yeah. Okay, then from there, all of a sudden, there were all kinds of problems. The war was going on, near misses, you know. Even before I went to America, I was supposed to, as I said, I was stranded in, in Cabrone. Uh, no, in, Fra in Francis Town that time, not Cabrone. And the planes couldn't anymore go because one night, we were supposed to take a plane, ANC plane, and we were happy dancing. People were singing the whole night. And 2.15 a.m., we were coming from the commissioner's office to take three swappers on that plane, as requested, and we just saw a flame at the airport. Boom! One guy with a camouflage in a uniform was sitting there and said, a little bit Indianish, very funny with green eyes, he said, that's a visitor's plane. That's the last, first and the last I heard from him. So that plane was meant to explode when we were in the air. A time bombing it was mis mistimed, so we were lucky. So those kind of uh, near misses were, misses were there on my life, you know. Also Kasinga, there was a famous Kasinga attack. There I also missed out because of the driver was late and he refused to take me during the night, so that way I also escaped my possible danger. But then I was also, after 12 years at the Institute, chosen to come back. Now things have moved, uh, negotiations move on, 435 had to be implemented. So I was chosen 
to be among the first leaders to come back. South African army was still here, war was still going on. Then we had to write a, a sign a ceasefire of South Africa through UN in a very convoluted way. And then uh, I was to come back and we took a Zambian Airways flight, DC-10, 180 people, I think. Some were soldiers, but every was disarmed, including the current president who was under me. I brought all of them back. And then landed here after 27 years of absence. The country has changed. We didn't know this place we do, because I was from Chumep, but it has just changed. And we had a wide member, very active member, advocate, Luboski, who, who would also come to Lusaka. And I used to buy the property from Lusaka through videos he was showing me. He was assigned to go to the Porsche area, identify a few houses there, three, identify Koma style, three houses, Kadutura, three houses, and some neutral area somewhere. So we're buying the property that way from Lusaka. And then he knew he was a conduct, he was in charge of administration. So he will be the one to help us. We didn't know anything, we didn't know shops even, we didn't know this place. And then as we are now setting up the structure to run modern administration, election campaign and so on, we had to tell the people, you see, this is part of the campaign. These people think we are just bush people, just know how to fight. We are even told to buy suits to come back. The people are saying, these people think you are just, you know, terrorists. It will be good to give the impression that you can run a country to buy suits. Some of us have to go to London to go and buy suits before we came back with me. And then we came dressed up and we landed there. We looked like business people ministers, maybe possible ministers. Okay, then to set up now the structure all over the country, difficult. Because the country, there was restriction that time for blacks to move around. So we didn't know the country. Some of us were here and we left when we were still young. So I, to make it a point that by Thursday I'm on the road, also learning the country, but to go all over the country set up the administrative structures, where possible also link with computers to show them we can do modern administration. All these things were war, it's a struggle still. And then, uh, short, make a long story short, campaign was good, it was tough, it was not easy, it was difficult for us because we were disadvantaged, because we came from outside, we didn't know the place very well, no people knowing us properly. That's why we chose the party list system. So that the party which is known can be the candidate, not us. So that way it's a party list. And after the party has gotten certain percentage, then you allocate the seat. That's what we are still doing up to now. And then thereafter, drafting a constitution, I was elected a chairman of the Constituent Assembly. That is to draft a constitution not independence, but constitu constituent assembly to draft the constitution. Again, the rumors were, oh, these people are not going to manage it because even blacks are divided and they will take time, two years or so, and I give them to finish that constitution. And I said, yeah, we are going to shock them. Uh, I said, what I have to do is to create confidence, build confidence. Then I, and there was hatred, you know, you could see, and also the fear of the unknown, why the whites and blacks were not mixing. So I decided to see all the leaders privately before I called the formal meeting to, to start drafting. I called them, I remember a white guy who died now, my soul rise in peace, David. He is now staying. He was staying in the house where the Atobo is. If you're going to Atobo's house, that's the house. So I said, yes, I would like to see you, Mr. David. Uh, and the reason is, as you know, I'm your chairman now, so I must know you outside the hall. 
Where? I said, your house. After I said your house, I told Prime Minister, now he's the Chief Justice, uh, Judge President, who was my permanent secretary. I said, let's go, man. I told that Bua, we called the Afrikaners, you know, that time Bua. I called that Bua, you know, he may do something, let's go together. You see, mistrust, there was no trust. So I came there, then his wife and he were waiting for me outside. And there was also a belief that we, as, as terrorists, uh, communists or so on, hated the white people and therefore their language called Africans. And some guys from the north don't know Africans, it's true. But some of us who were trained here knew Africans, of course. That's the only language we knew besides in, we, we learn English outside. So they say we don't speak Africans, we hate Africaners, we hate Africans. And there was this uprising in South Africa against that language. So there was a belief. So when I came there, I overheard them speaking Africans. He was saying something to his wife in Africans. And I just said, I also want to have web posty. Now, when I said that, that was already it, it completely, I mean, open, I mean, it, it, it just made it, you know, because here is a person that you are suspicious of, who hate Africaners, and here is this guy talking Africans, and also asking Africaners, eyes broken. When we went in, already that helped. I'm sorry, I moved. <laughs> uh, when, when I went in, uh, we sat down, no more tense situation. Uh, we talked, joke about tea, the tea came, we drank. And believe me or not, up to today, I'm still drinking rare post tea since that day. <laughs> and I told him, Mr. David, I'm here. You know, I'm through and through Swapo that you cannot doubt. But I am now elected as the chairman, your chairman. And that's why I came to see you to see what, what's your bottom line? What, what, what are your fears about the black government? Why are you afraid of Swapo government? Uh, for instance, I didn't like your government because I would like my children, like your children, to have three square meals a day it is to have lights to study during the night, go out unmolested and come back. Those are the things we have been fighting for. Yes, those are precisely the same principles I stand for, and Christian education. So I said, you see, Mr. David, it's a fear of the unknown. You and I have the same concerns for our children, but because we are not talking, we are not meeting, hence the fear, you see. We can finish this constitution in no time because we are all Namibians. We have the same concerns, peace, unity, children to play together. Why should we take that long time to draft a constitution? So we talk. So what are your main concerns? He says, now, only concern to me is that education must be a Christian-based education. And we would like 10 best schools <laughs> to be set aside for whites only. What a contradiction. Here we are trying to do how we have apartheid, and a guy is still asking to reserve. And I asked him the names, and he gave the best schools. So I said, oh, thank you. I'll, I will go and share this with my colleagues. When the administrator general was told apparently by him that I asked that, and he gave 10 names. Administrator General made a mistake and took that responsibility over and talked to the white people to already prepare them. He was supposed to have been neutral also, but he took that and started to now advocate it. And when he was talking somewhere, lucky enough, uh, Derek March, who was also the white uh, leader, and Pretorius, who was a conservative white leader, both reacted negatively to the idea. We are trying to abolish apartheid. We are trying to bring again a new rich man's apartheid, as Derek Musk named it. In my thesis, I will give you a thesis 
it's there, you will see it. So that's what happened, and we were sort of helped that way. I talked to all others too, and then when I called a meeting formally, I knew everybody. I kind of knew how they are thinking and so on. And then drafting, I told them, I'm going to give you a marital Christmas gift, because the belief was it will take us two years to draft the constitution. I said now, and we took three months. Three months, miracle as they call it, and we had a constitution, one of the best in Africa, if not the world, they say it, they said it that way. And basically drafting was made easier because uh, everybody had their own constitution, draft, draft, document, constitutional principles were the same, human rights questions and so on. So all I did is to look at material differences. Why should we waste time on things we agree on? Uh, so, material difference, where do we really differ? Where do these documents differ? The differences were on the question of nature of the presidency. Uh, the internal groups had fear about executive presidents. They thought they have too much power in Africa, therefore they become dictators. And then we had, considering the question of bandu stance, where the country was divided according to tribal in our origins and so on, we wanted to have a strong government to unite the people. So we're talking about a strong executive, strong central government and so on. And then uh, uh, the other said, now that is a uh, remedy, I mean, that is a medicine recipe for African dictatorship. So with that, that non-democrats being more democratic and therefore talking about African dictatorship. So that is one, material differences. Then the nature of the legislature, whether you are going to buy a cameral or unicameral uh, parliament, and then the electoral system. So those were the only three things we had to debate. Why wasting time on human rights, things that we all agreed on? Because of that isolation of the problem, it was easy. We tackled the issue of the presidency. Long and short of it is that at the end uh, we decided the president's, president must be accountable. My problem, we told them, it's not because our president is a, a executive president or you put power in the prime minister's office. That's not what, it's not local that makes the president dictator or so on. It's a question of how you make them to be accountable. The accountability and checks and balances are the ones that can make that person to be controlled, but not because he's called president or prime minister, anything. If you give person too much power, anybody can become a dictator, let's put it that way. So based on that, we even the term limits, we got it from there, two five-year term, copied from America, the four years we took five years, and uh, it was tough there. Uh, I didn't know that the president will, because in our case we already knew who was going to be the president, like like the George Washington, I think people knew. So that was the same debate they had uh, in Philadelphia Convention, because I said there are only three conventions: that's the uh, Philadelphia Convention, Paris in our Assembly National Party and I mean we have to convention. That's how I talk about it in the thesis. So uh, is that concern that you know already who's going to be a person you're talking about, you personalize the issue instead of being objective. So they knew about somebody who was a tough guy and so on. So we had to say term limit. Now, after I agreed, I had to go and brief him to tell him, because he was not drafter. There were only 21 people who were drafting the constitution. So I had to go and brief him. Yes, complete, we are doing well. We are making progress, but there are some problems here and there. Uh, the puppets, I have to say that word, you know, puppets to get. To, the puppets want to have, uh, to control, you know, uh, term limit and maybe just 10 years. Now 10 years is enough, I'll be old. I nearly collapsed because I thought I was going to struggle now to convince him and so on. When I said that, now it's all right. Ah, relieved. I went back, adopted. Term limit, very good. 
And then, legislature, yes, uh, so we wanted to have a unicameral uh, parliament. The opposition thought it would be good to have uh, two chambers. One, like uh, in America, like Senate, we should have equal representation. Philadelphia debate came up. With it. And the other one will be proportional representation. So National Assembly is proportional. You, are, you have a party list, and the party is elected proportionate to what the party got, the seats are allocated. And then the other one is by first past the post constituency basis. So that's what we did, and that's what we still have. We have to review it now. How is it working to me? There are a lot of flaws that I could now correct now. So that's it. And then electoral system, we ironed that out, and we got elections. Independence was declared. I became now the prime minister, first prime minister to set up the whole administrative structure. It was not a joke. It was not easy. But we are doing it of ease, you know, as if we have, I was helped by my stint at the UN management a little bit and basically my stay for 12 years in Dusaka at the UN level, quite high level. So I used to go back always to Washington, up to, to New York to participate at the UN General Assembly level and reporting in the committees. A little bit help and studying. Everything I'm assigned, I buy books, I log myself and I read up. So uh, I think I, I was successful setting up the system. I became prime minister, I stayed there for 12 years. That's not easy when you have an executive president who appoints the prime minister and prime minister to last that long, it's not easy. Some just last, in France, I know a prime minister I met who lasted only for two years. So it's not easy, so I pride myself. I stayed that long for 12 years. Then I was finished blood pressure. You see, God, I didn't go to church those days. I went to church last time, maybe 62, before I left the country, or 61, actually. And all those years in your country, I didn't go. You are, you are not Christians, so I didn't go to church then. <laughs> and then when I was finished, I would think, my blood pressure was high. I was not sleeping, just three hours per night. Terrible. Frustrated because I couldn't get all the things done. Some people sabotaging politically and so on. I wanted to resign twice. But then the old man relieved me. And I was, that day, it was Tuesday, I remember. Uh, Dr. Nikki was engaging. There was a tent, and this place was empty. And then that Tuesday, the place just filled up. Church people came to me. So what is it now? I was laughing at them. Why are you here? The moment I was relieved, I, I, I was already feeling light, happy, and so on. All the burdens gone. It's true. And from the following day on, my blood pressure from 190 and so on was already about 145 to uh, 70 or so on, relieved. And then they started to have services here. Following daily, two weeks of visit. But what was going on is that there were three, three recurrent in our themes. Things happen for a purpose. And I said, now that I tried to connect it, it happened for a purpose because I was sick. Maybe I would have died if I remained there. Heart attack or so on, frustration. So it happened for a purpose. Then they say when one door closes, many other doors open. Yes, I was getting offers left and right, country and abroad. And then later on I took the World Bank offer. So it's true. One door closes, many other doors open. But the important one was, what goes around comes around. Now people who were sabotaging me, who were fighting, we were fired. I said, what goes around comes around. <laughs> 
So that's what happened. That was now the career I had. Then we can move on. I went to Washington for at a five year contract, good money. But I was not going there to stay again. I just went to change, to drive myself, get lost. Nobody to laugh at me. <laughs> I just have been driven by these guys and so on. And these guys were very good to me. When I used to come back, they would even take leave. If I came weekdays, three guys were assigned to me. He has been with me for a long time. They would take leave and then drive me. We can see. okay, so that's the relationship we create with people. And then I came back from Washington. I sneaked in, actually. I came Friday evening. And Swapo Caucus was sitting now to elect people for parliament. And in our system that time, if you are a candidate, you don't stand up. If you are not a candidate, you must stand up and declare. It was few people are not going to be candidates, that's why. So fewer ones must get up and say, I'm not going to stand because of this and this. So there were two. One was from Africa Development Bank, and I was from the World Bank. So we were sitting there, and those who are not going to be candidates, and they were all looking at me, my side, I was just scribbling. And then other guys stood up and said, I'm not going to stand because I'm of Africa Development Bank. They were looking at my side, I'm down, said our candidate. So they voted. Uh, I was about number 10. No campaign, nothing for the parliament. I was so happy. And then thereafter, I'm back in the parliament, backbencher. I, I became a chairman of the economic committee. I again changed the scene there to tell the truth. People will say, oh, we didn't know this kind of committee is existing. I have going to the country, hearings, hearings, and that kind of things. Then made a chief whip from nowhere. I didn't like that one too, but just imposed on me. And then thereafter, went back to the Politburo to the nominated to be vice president of the party. And here I am today, I'm a vice president. I'm not anymore a backbencher, now I'm a minister of trade and industry. The thing I didn't know anything about. Again, I bought the books, I read <laughs> trade, the definition of trade. I got the idea of trade across border and commerce was normally olden days within the country. I trade, I read all these things, I, I buy books. So I don't know a topic, but I, you see, education means, uh, education means how to find what you don't know. You see, so I know how to research, like you are doing, to discover what you don't know, that's just education. Not to memorize things, it's to know how to find what you don't know, that's education. So I buy books, I read, and I'm here. I'm not an economist, but I'm now heading the most economic department I'm also the chairman of the cluster of economic uh, ministries. I'm, and we're doing very well. I'm telling you, people are saying that, not me. <laughs> That's my story. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. Do you mind if I ask um, if you have any interesting, any maybe one or two other interesting anecdotes during the, the liberation struggle? You know, we, we heard some interesting ones from Mr. Hishono. He, he, was, he, he was sent to Cuba for many years and he told us a couple you know, funny ones. Do you have any interesting ones? Well, there are many. You know, you're sitting in some bar with, uh, mm. you know, Sam and Yoma and you guys realize, oh, wow, you know, let's do this now. Or, I don't know. No, 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 we're in New York, boys, what do you mean? We're in New York, I... I, I, I was hiding something because I told you that I would start my day at 11 o'clock, then end up 1 o'clock, that's from Monday to Friday. Fridays from UN, I'm in Harlem. There was a place called Small's Paradise. Huh? It's a nightclub, very famous one. I don't know whether it's still there. Say up there, you know, party, party, up to 4 o'clock. There was no crime. I was never attacked in Harlem. I would be leaving 4 a.m., <laughs> walking back, you know. That was a life, you know, Saturdays, young people's parties and so on. But uh, Sunday is off, chill off. It's up to now, that's my pardon. As I said, 
I can drink normally Friday and Saturday afternoon, two o'clock and so not in the morning. But Sunday, chill off. Even now, I am that way. Of course, when I became Prime Minister, I stopped drinking because drop Prime Minister must be serious. I thought so. Twelve years, I didn't touch any, any beer, what, nothing. Alcohol. So, but we had a lot of things, uh, as I said. Uh, where they were near misses, when you come back and you're in the, in the, in the struggle, it was tough. Uh, the things went wrong. There were accusations of spies and people being picked up. Some never came back. You know. That was the most trying period, the struggle. And we were in the middle of that. I had students, I had to protect them. Then you go to the Politburo, you have to now discuss who is a spy, who is not a spy. Now due process, because we were in the bush, and some innocent people could have been caught up. So, of course, I came to the parliament, I did tell them that no war is good. You go to war because <laughs> if you are a choice, you would never go to a war. But you went to the war because all avenues were closed, that's why. But now war is good. People die, innocent people die. So that could have been a case in our war too. I'm sorry for that. But, but he's a sitting trooper of mine as too many. We were just in New York with you guys. What you are doing, I have to. Everything you are doing. Is <laughs> we grew up we grew up there in New York City, so you should see a young guys that time. Now I'm an old man, but that time I was young. <laughs> do you mind if I ask you one or two more contemporary questions? Because our project, we do want to try to bring it as close to the present as we can. Um, a few days ago, we got a tour of the Walvis Bay port. And I know that the, the gentleman who was driving us around showed us where they were going to be reclaiming all this land to build it up. And, I forgot how many hundred thousand uh, crates per year were going to be added, but what do you see this, um, how long do you see this taking, and what do you uh, see it bringing to Namibia? Because I know there's also going to, if you add, let's say, 300,000 more containers, you're going to have to do something then with uh, trains to, to, to accommodate this, otherwise it's not going to help at all. Um, in this sort of thing, what plans uh, to further Namibia's development do you see going on? Well, firstly, uh, we have what some of us dreamt about, uh, the vision, the vision 2030. It's, it's uh, the state that maybe will be industrialized or whatever, because the basic necessities in life, that's what we dreamt about that time. And within that visioning, we also have some kind of corridor concept. Uh, we have realized that Namibia is very small. We have a giant South Africa where everything is. And now country developed industrialization. You take a niche where you are good at and you add value to that. And if you look at Namibia and all, uh, all other former colonial power countries, they raw materials. They're taken out in a raw form, value added that side, and sent back, like the tiles and so on. You see tiles, we have the marble and so on. It goes to Italy, they cut it there and send it back to us. So value addition, now we thought, since we're talking about regional integration, and eventually Africa's integration as an economic bloc, union government, all these things. But Nyerere's views prevailed that we must first have economic integration. So we have, we have what they call REC, Regional Economic Commissions. We have what is called SATEC, uh, ECOWAS in West Africa. We have East African Community, etc. So we have to harmonize our political, our economic policies, SATEC. Now we realize, but it's our niche, a small country. We have a good harbor, efficient, 
South Africa has good harbors, but they are overcrowded. We have land dog countries, Zambia, Botswana, all of them. Zimbabwe, Zai, uh, DRC. And Botswana is very eager to use our port as the outlet. So we were proactive. We gave them uh, dry ports, Wolfish Bay, and Botswana is making use of it. Zambia, all Zambia copper is now coming through roads to that harbor. So, uh, so much so that Botswana is boasting that they are no longer a uh, landlocked country, they are sea linked country. So, we have that. We think we can provide service. That's an instant we can provide service through that corridor. And therefore, to get more goods from land locked countries, to use waters as a harbor, you have to improve on harbor facilities. That's why. Uh, dredging and so on are now being talked about. Not only that, even Angola, which has very big harbors, are using Wolfish Bay. Why? Because of efficiency and security. We have to maintain that as our, our niche and therefore they must come. And that's how we can make money. Also with tourism, regional tourism, we are saying uh, service in that city to service land of countries, they must use very efficient harbor. Therefore, you must improve on it, make it modern, and so on. And the team we have there is very good. And then, regional tourism. It's very expensive, it's very slow, as you are saying. Uh, but if we pay money from the United States to come to Africa, it's too costly. Southern Africa, especially. So, for group tourism, you, you come to Namibia, you must go to uh, Zimbabwe. They have their own same thing that Namibia doesn't have. South Africa, Table Mountain, that kind of a thing. We are a group, regional tourism. And Namibia, uh, you see, we are a resource-based country. We have a small population. And we think, wrongly, of course, we are using World Bank's statistics, how they arrive at GDP and then per capita income, which I'm quarreling with the European Union always because Namibia has resources of small population, blessing. I think I, I like that. And if we can utilize our resources properly, start to add value here. Fishing industry, we try to do that already. Before they used to just catch this fish with the uh, trawlers that they could just uh, can them on the sea, disappear. Russian, Cuban, all this, Spanish especially, we stop that. So we say we are now regulating the industry. You have to get quotas every year to control the species. Uh, and we give you the rights for 10 years to plan, but every year we must get you the quota. So that way we know, and you must land. If you land to create a factory, to create jobs, Transfer of technology, we give you more. That's incentive. So it's working. Many companies have set up very, very good factories. Industry, actually. We have industry, unlike West Africa, they don't have an industry. Like, it's a fishing industry that we have here. One of the best, you know, well maintained and so on. So that's one. And uranium. We have uranium, we have diamonds. We want value to be added here. Therefore, there are many polishing companies now setting up here. And not only to cut, but to create jewelry. That's how you develop, you know. So value addition what we are emphasizing now for our development, to add value. Everything we have, less realize, therefore change the value manufacturing. Like those things are, like the water, put it in a bottle, it becomes industrial product. Then I come in my ministry. When you are working with your hands as an agriculture person, uh -uh, I don't come there. The moment you have fruits, I come to that industry so we can market it. Yeah. I think the, probably the last question we want to ask, we've been talking with, we talked with one of the gentlemen who works at the Walvis Bay, EBZ, and he says that there's going to be a European commission to evaluate because it's now been 15 years, 17 years, something like that, 17, mm. since the beginning of 
this scheme. And some, in some cases, he said, well, the, for the most part, it's been pretty successful with theirs, partially due to location. Some of the ones in other parts of the country have been less successful. Um, of course, this commission is still going on. The report's not out yet. What do you think that um, its conclusions will be? I myself am interested in knowing whether the EBZ concept is working and effective, as we perceive it to be in the beginning. I have my doubts too. I have my doubts. The EBZ concept is that you locate, I would say, anywhere in the country, provided you are exporting. You don't pay taxes, no duties. That's the purpose of it. We are hoping to attract big companies to locate here. And we are about to succeed to attract big companies, South African connected companies, as South Africa became democratic too. So those who are trying to set up on the EPZ change. Why go to the second best if I can go to the best? So they went to South Africa. Therefore, I think it made the concept that we perceived very well not that very important. Because definitely there are countries, there are, there are companies who will use it. But as we thought of it to cash in on South Africa, that was taken away and South Africa became democratic. So we are reviewing it. I don't think it's a viable concept in the long run. Yes, just manufacture, add value, sell here, pay taxes. That's the future. <laughs>